So for our prepared speaker today is Tom Shi. Tom will be doing his project number two from the storytelling manual. That's an advanced speech. The objective is to tell a personal story. Now, Tom didn't have a resolution for 2011. However, he pointed out that he really needs to find an advisor in a thesis title for his master's degree by the end of April. So if anybody can help him out with that, I'm sure that will be appreciated. So introduce Tom Shi. speech is Fishing for Profit. It starts with my cousin Richard. Richard is from Taiwan like me. He is a little shorter, has more hair, he's thinner, <laughs> and he's a whole lot darker for reasons that will become obvious later on. He didn't go to college like I did. He didn't go that route. He's a, he was an entrepreneur. He saw a niche to open a jewelry store in Chinatown, New York, and he made quite a bit of money. You know importing diamonds and gold from Taiwan, Southeast Asia, where it's produced relatively inexpensively, sell it for modest profit in Chinatown. And he, he made enough money, and by the time other people start doing copycat stores, opening up jewelry right next to him, he said, I made enough money, I'm gonna sell my business. And he bought a mid-sized commercial fishing boat. And he drove that boat from New York Harbor all the way down, and sleeping in the boat along the Atlantic coast, all the way down to Florida. And he found Summerland Keys. It's not as famous as Key West, but it's one of the seven keys. And he bought a house, parked his boat right there. So I said, I've got to go visit this cousin. You know, he's living the dream. He already retired at the age of 35 as a millionaire. And now he's fishing and then doing tax returns, you know, filing himself as a commercial fisherman. <laughs> so I drove three days. I was stationed in Louisiana. I went, drove three days down to see him in Florida and I begged him, can I go work with you? You know, just tag along. Because it's just another day of work for him, but for me, it would be like charter fishing for the whole day, for free. <laughs> so he agreed, and we went out. We, 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 we got in the boat, and we drove about 30 minutes to where the GPS says, you know, where he last stopped. There was good fish. Of course, we can't see the shorelines anymore. I don't know if we're in the Gulf of Mexico or Straits of Florida, but it was, you know, it was all, ocean all around. And then he opened up the cooler. We had ice, and we had chum. If you're not familiar with chum, chum is like a tight meshing bag packed full of fish guts and blood and oil. And he kind of, the whole thing is frozen. You put it in the water, and as the, the currents go by up and down, the boat's going up and down, the little pieces start to melt. And then it, it's kind of advertisement to the fish community that said, there's free food here. <laughs> but we are going to trick some of you into coming to the boat. <laughs> and our target fish was yellowtails. Yellowtails are, the full name is yellowtail snappers. They grow to be about 18 inches long, one to two pounds, very fairly aggressive, good game fish. And the distinguishing mark, of course, is the yellow line all the way from their eye to the tail, and then the tail fans out, fork deeply like the shape of the letter C, and the whole thing is bright yellow. So you know when you catch a yellowtail, because he has a yellow tail. And the first couple fish was fine, you know, you, you, you wait for the rod to hit, and then it bends over, so, you pull it, and then you get some slack, and you reel, reel it up, and then you pull it again, and then, then bring up the slack. After about bringing up two yellowtails, the third fish, okay, I got the tension on the rod, and then all of a sudden, it just goes limp. But it still has a little weight, like a little dead weight on the, on the fishing rod. So I thought, what happened? And then as I brought it up out of the, out of the water, it was just a fish head. It was still bleeding. And something just bit it in half. And my cousin turned to me and said, yeah, you know what, the chum also attracted the attention of the barracudas. Okay, they're like giant, they're kind of a cross between a T-Rex and an alligator. <laughs> fish with a really large head, a lot of teeth, and they are so smart. They figured out that if they just wait underneath the fishing boat, and then as the yellow tails come in because their, their mouth is hooked, oh. and their, the swimming ability to evade is, is compromised. So they just take a bite out of it just before we bring it up. So my cousin Richard gave me advice. He says, just reel it up faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried that, but most of the time, I end up just facilitating an easy meal for the barracuda. He can bring it up about 80, 90% of the time. And this gets to be a little depressing after a while, because he's bringing up the fish. I'm not contributing to the profit. 
So I'm like, oh man, this is gonna be a drag. But about middle of the day, we had a school of jack fish that visited. You know, kind of like a super organism, thousands of fish that swims together, and they all turn at the same time. And they decided to, to clean up the chum for us. And at the same time, of course, they hit our rods. So we're bringing up the jackfish as quickly as we can rebait our hooks. I mean, as soon as we drop it in the water, there's another jack. There's another jack. Wow. <laughs> and at one point, I was curious. I said, I'm going to try putting this cigarette butt, because my, my cousin Richard smoked. And I'm going to put it on the hook and throw it back in the water, and soon enough, they don't look. They just hit it. <laughs> so I don't know how many people out there can claim that they ever caught a fish with a cigarette butt. <laughs> but I did that. <clears throat> and the feeding frenzy lasted about three minutes. And they're all gone. The ocean is calm again. And we went back to kind of a semi, you know, sad business of fishing yellowtail. I mean, he was doing okay. My cousin has learned, I think he can actually tell when the fish is trying to fight his line or trying to evade the barracuda. So he, I think he gives the slack at just the right time so the fish actually comes down to the boat in one piece. But just before sunset, there is a, there's a rod, there's a heavy duty rod that is mounted at the end of the 30 feet boat. It's so big and the hook is like two inches across. And we had no problem finding a bait to put on that hook because I know I was bringing out all kinds of fish carcasses, right? <laughs> so we just put like a half a fish on there, we threw it in there, didn't think about much, and then all of a sudden the, 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 the rod bends over it, and then I didn't want to mess it up, so Richard took it. He, he brought it up. After a good struggle, it was a huge red snapper, okay? It's like wow. 20 pounds, blah, blah, this big. It was unexpected. And then my cousin turned to me and said, it's, it's because you came along, so you brought me good fortune. So that, that was pretty much the big and the last big catch. And we went back to the fish market. We're not going to keep the fish because we're fishing for profit. So we sell it back to the market, and then they in turn double the price and sell it to customers. We sold the jacks, about two dozen of them, for like $5 altogether. They're cheap fish, you know, a quarter of a pound. <laughs> he sold the yellow jacks. He caught most of them, about $70, $80. But the red snapper, the giant, well, sells $14 out there a pound. He gets seven dollars a pound, and we brought in like 150 bucks on that one fish alone. So the total profit over 200 dollars. He went to pay for the ice, pay for the chum, pay for the fuel and maintenance of the boat. But most importantly, it gave me a fantastic fishing story that I told you today, and it's mostly true as far as far as I can recall. <laughs>